Hey, this is Charlie Thompson and welcome to the pre-lab video for lab 12 on plate tectonics. So the key to real estate is location, 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 and with plate tectonics, especially when it comes to earthquakes and volcanoes, the key is location, location, location. The key to earthquakes and volcanoes is location, location, yeah, you get it. So here's the structure of Earth. This is a cheesy diagram. And let me get my laser pointer. That's good enough. So uh, there's the crust, oceanic, oceanic crust is about five kilometers thick, continental crust, 40 to 60 kilometers thick. Both of those parts float around and are attached to the uppermost mantle, which is rigid. Both the crust and the mantle, the uppermost mantle, float around on the gooey asthenosphere, which has a consistency like silly putty or bread dough. It moves very slowly. The, the lower mantle, the upper mantle, they're moving with these convection currents caused, we think, by the heat of the inner core. Here's a cooler diagram of Earth. So the asthenosphere is gooey. I shouldn't have picked a red dot. I can't change it. What are you going to do? Uh, the inner core is solid. The outer core is liquid. This is rock, but it's so hot and under such intense pressure that it actually moves. It, it flows very slowly. The uppermost mantle and crust, that's what the tectonic plates are made of. So uh, we've got the asthenosphere, the gooey caramel layer, the uppermost mantle, which is solid rock. Here we have oceanic crust, which is basaltic. Uh, when it melts, it flows very easily. Here we have uppermost mantle and continental crust. Continental crust chemically is closer to granite, and when it melts, it's very, very, very thick, like toothpaste or mashed potatoes. That's Alfred Lothar Wegener. He proposed the idea of continental drift in 1912. However, he didn't have a mechanism to explain how the things, how the continents were moving around. So it wasn't a very good theory or very good hypothesis. He had excellent evidence. He had geologic evidence. He had fossil evidence. He had the fit of the continental margins, but without a mechanism to explain how anything's moving, not, not, nobody's going to believe it. 1960s, there was a flood of data that confirmed his idea, and his hypothesis is now the theory of plate tectonics. So here's an animation showing the last 400, and I'm going to speed it up a little bit. Kill the volume. I don't think there is any volume. So the plates have been moving around for the entire time that we've had crust. And as they move around, they come together. Yeah, let's speed that up just a little bit more. The plates come together and they get stuck. Here you can see a little drifting blob of North America. And the most recent time that all the plates were together, they created this supercontinent called Pangaea, and then they broke up. But before that, they were moving around, and they bunched together and broke up and bunched together and broke up and bunched together and broke up and bunched together. And that's just what the plates have been doing throughout Earth's history. So we're at uh, 400 million years ago. Here's North America still. Scandinavia is over here. This is the development of the Appalachians and some of the Scandinavian mountains prior to all the continents coming together to make Pangaea. So now we're getting to the, what to geographers anyway, is the more familiar 220 odd million years ago. So we've got Antarctica, we've got India, we've got Australia, South America, Africa, North America, and Eurasia. And then like, you know, 100, 160, 180 million years ago, we're going to see the Atlantic start to split. 180, 170. So North America splitting off from Africa and from Eurasia.
And then we're going to see um, India break off and race up to China like it's <laughs> like China still owes India money. And now we've got South America and Africa split off from Antarctica. We have the South Atlantic Basin opening up. We've got India beginning to move up. And yeah, just watch India race past Africa, race past Australia. So this is about the way the world looked when the dinosaurs went extinct. The impact was here off of the Yucatan Peninsula. There goes India racing up to China. Very nice. The impact, the, uh, the compression causing the Himalayas to rise up in the same way that Italy is getting shoved into, into Europe, making the Alps. And here we've got the last, let me get rid of that, the last glacial maximum dropped sea level about 360 feet. There was so much ice locked up on the land. You could walk from France to England. You could walk from India out all the way down to Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, or rather, I'm sorry. Yeah, you could walk from India down into Indonesia. You could walk from Australia up to Papua New Guinea, a very different world at the time. And then the ice melted, sea level rose, and we, we're, we're here. So fossil evidence, uh, this land reptile that they found evidence of in South America and Africa makes no sense because they're separated by a saltwater ocean. Same thing with this other land reptile found in Africa, India, Antarctica, this fern found from Australia to Antarctica. Anyway, if you look at the distribution of these organisms on a map today, their distribution makes no sense. Like this freshwater reptile can't swim in salt water, it's going to die. And yet it's found in South America and Africa. But if you put the continents back together in the shape that they were when those organisms were alive, they had a continuous distribution. Like this wasn't, there wasn't a huge gap here. These freshwater reptiles existed across a landmass that existed here. So we've got fossil evidence. You'll see paleoclimatological evidence. So we think, see things like deserts in what are now tropics. We have coal swamps in places that are now not tropical. We have tropical reefs in locations that aren't tropical. We have glaciation in places. We have evidence of huge ice sheets in places that today are in the tropics. So here is the fit of the continents. Um, yeah, roughly 220 million years ago with glaciation occurring at the South Pole. And those continents have now moved to be South Africa, I'm sorry, South America, Africa, India, and Australia. And right on the equator at sea level, there's no way you're getting glaciation, but there's evidence of glaciation in all these places, some of which are now quite hot. But like I said, if you put it back together the way it was, it all makes sense. So that's some of the evidence that Wegener was looking at. We've got lithospheric plates of crust and uppermost mantle floating on the asthenosphere. The good stuff happens at the boundaries. Almost all the exciting stuff, mountain building, earthquakes, volcanoes, most of that's happening at the edges where two different plates are coming into contact with each other. There's about 14 plates at present. Some of the things going on, we've got upwelling of new magma. Uh, at sea, at uh, spreading centers across the ocean floor. We've got plates moving around. We've got sea floor. Some sea floors are spreading and getting larger, which means that some old sea floor material is then subducting at the edges. Subducting, because you can't make new material. It's not like Earth is getting bigger. So any new material that gets added to the crust, some old material is subducting under. And evidence of that excitement are earthquakes, volcanoes, fall, folding and faulting, and mountain building. All of those are a result of plate tectonics. So here's the plates. Uh, we are on the North American plate. If, unless, well, 
Okay. If you're in Sacramento, you're on the North American plate. If you're in San Francisco, you're probably on the Pacific plate. Some plates like the North American plate are made of continental and oceanic crust. Some like the Pacific plate are just oceanic crust. And that's going to be a huge difference that oceanic crust when it melts, well, chemically it's basalt. And when it melts, it's very fluid. Continental crust when it melts is very, very stiff. So here we've got upwelling in the Atlantic with the uh, mid-oceanic ridge where new materials coming up, pushing the Atlantic apart. Well, if the Atlantic's getting bigger, then that means some place is getting smaller. So the Pacific, parts of the Pacific plate are diving under South America, which is the reason that the Andes Mountains are there along with their volcanoes and massive earthquakes. You know, notice that that's not happening on the east coast of South America or on the west coast of Africa because the African plate is made up of continental and oceanic crust. So the whole thing is moving as a unit. But here, the Pacific plate and the South American plate, two different plates, the oceanic crust is more dense, so it sinks. This is a map of the ocean floor. I just love them because they're beautiful. This was made by Marie Tharp one of our most famous scientists in plate tectonics. So you've got this wrinkly area is the mid-oceanic ridge where the crust is spreading apart and new material is coming up. And as that new material comes up, and so right along this ridge is where the new material is coming up. So there's subduction and trenches then all around the Pacific. Uh, the Pacific often called the ring of fire because of that subduction and those earthquakes. So this is a map of the plate boundaries. This is a map of the plates. So like the South American plate, the African plate, the North American plate, the Pacific plate. And this is a map of the plates along with the type of boundaries. So in this case, the yellow and I realize this will make more sense in just a minute, but the yellow, the yellow plates, the yellow lines rather are convergent where the two plates are coming together. The red are divergent where the two plates are spreading apart and the blue are transform boundaries where the two different plates are just grinding against each other horizontally. Nobody's subducting, nobody's going up, nobody's going down. They're just grinding past each other like the San Andreas Fault. And one of the important lines of evidence for plate tectonics that you'll see when you start playing around with the Seismic Explorer was the distribution of volcanoes that match up exquisitely, beautifully. Earthquakes and volcanoes match up beautifully with the tectonic boundaries. So here you can see all around the rim of the Pacific, we've got volcanic activity in South America, Central America, North America, Alaska, into Kamchatka, and down into Japan, the Philippines, and Indonesia. Same, same map, but this time showing epicenters of earthquakes over time. And this is showing the ages of crust in 20 million chunks. So here we've got a spreading center. So this is 0 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, 80 to 100. So we've got 100 million year old crust. This was another, when they started dating the crust on both sides of the spreading centers, they realized that they're symmetrical, that it's growing off of both sides, spreading away from the center um, on both sides. Um, and then the width, like right here, this is 20 million years of movement. That's a lot of movement compared to right here in the Atlantic. That's 20 million years of movement. That's 20 million years of movement. So by looking at a map of the ages of crust, you can get an idea what the speeds of the movement of the plates are. So this is from the Seismic Explorer. This is showing epicenters of earthquakes. They are color-coded by depth, with the red being very shallow earthquakes and the yellow green and blue being deeper and deeper and deeper earthquakes. So the size tells you how big the earthquake was and the color tells you how deep that earthquake was. So this is a video put out by Pearson Prentice Hall about the different types of plate movement. And I figure pictures worth a thousand words. This is a divergent plate. You can tell it's a divergent plate because it says 
divergent boundary. So at a divergent plate boundary, for example, down the middle of the entire Atlantic Ocean, new material is coming up and the two plates are spreading apart with the newest material at the center. Uh, typically we'd see shallow earthquakes, um, maybe some small volcanic activity here, but this is a divergent boundary where the plates are coming apart. And I said before, if they're coming apart, some plates are going together. So this is a convergent boundary, convergent coming together with uh, earthquakes caused by the friction. And as we'll see later, let me just pause this for a second. When we look at the earthquakes later, you'll see uh, it's especially with the example, the video from the Pacific Northwest, that there's three, three, three broad categories for this lab that we'll be looking at. There are shallow earthquakes or crustal earthquakes. So that would be like here, shallow, relatively small earthquakes. There are deep earthquakes. Uh, those are going to be more powerful. For example, in this slab, as this slab of rock is sinking, there's stress, and so there's going to be earthquakes as it gets sucked down and, and moved around. And then eventually the earthquakes stop because the plate is melted. There's only friction between these two plates because they're solid rock grinding against each other. Once this plate has melted and it's liquid, there's no more resistance, there's no more earthquakes. So looking at the depths of earthquakes tells us how long, how long these slabs of subducting crust last before they get hot enough to melt. We're also going to see explosive earthquakes. This is another, going back to the idea of location. So with a convergent boundary, you get explosive earthquakes. This would be the Pacific Northwest. This would be Japan. This would be all the Aleutian Islands. Explosive earthquakes and the possibility for deep earthquakes and also for crustal earthquakes, earthquakes that are occurring where two crustal plates are grinding past each other. So that's a convergent boundary. We're gonna have explosive, dangerous volcanoes. We're gonna have moderate, moderate deep earthquakes, shallow earthquakes. And then a transform boundary is just, like I said, when they're moving past each other horizontally. So this would be a left lateral transform fault. If you're standing on this side, looking across, it's moving to your left. If you're standing here, looking to this side, it's moving to your left. So those are the three types of plate boundaries. So this would this is the way California looked. I'm going to pause it again. This is the way California looked um, 120 million years ago to about 80 million years ago. There was a spreading center offshore, shallow earthquakes, maybe some tiny volcanoes. And then you had the, um, well, this would be, oceanic crust, and then the uppermost mantle subducting, melting, bubbling back up. And as the as it bubbles, as the magma, because it's hotter, it's less dense, and it rises up through this solid rock, melts its way up through, as it gets closer to the surface, gas bubbles come out, like when you open a beer or any carbonated beverage. When you remove the pressure, the bubbles come out, and that gas comes out of solution of the melted rock. And if the lava is oceanic material, the gas just bubbles up and goes away harmlessly. If it's this continental material, then the pressure builds and builds and builds and then it explodes, often uh, quite violently. So subduction gives us deeper earthquakes and gives us explosive volcanoes. Um, here we've got a divergent boundary and you can see that this part of the divergent boundary is moving to the right, this part's moving to the left, this part's moving to the right, this part's moving to the left, but there's this little offset section where the two plates are grinding past each other. This one's going from left to right, and this one's going from right to left. So in this little section right here, that's the actual transform boundary right there because this plate is moving to the left, this plate's moving to the left, they're in agreement. This part's moving to the right, this part's moving to the left, so in this area there's conflict. There's friction, there's earthquakes, transform fault. Uh, that's pretty much it. That's pretty good. Subduction, explosive earthquakes. And really quickly, I just want to show you, really quickly, I want to show you another animation of a transform fault. Thanks, Pearson. So if we zoom in a bit to the Mid-Oceanic Ridge, 
Maybe something will happen at some part. There you go. So this part is moving from the left to the right. This part's moving from the right to the left. So in this section, you're gonna have earthquakes. Over here, they're both moving to the left. Over here, they're both moving to the right. So it's the offset sections of divergent faults that create transform faults. You really can't have one without the other. So seafloor spreading and subduction zones. We just saw some animation of all that stuff. Seafloor spreading at, at the mid-oceanic ridge. Divergent boundaries. There's a picture of a divergent boundary. There you go. Mid-oceanic ridge. New material comes up. This plate is moving that way. This plate's moving that way. Convergent. They're coming together. Again, associated with explosive eruptions, deep earthquakes. Also, megathrust earthquakes, which I haven't talked about yet. If this plate is subducting and it gets stuck, and the pressure builds and builds and builds, eventually you could have a megathrust earthquake, which are the largest earthquakes. Subduction, oceanic crust always subducts under continental crust. Oceanic crust has a density of about three grams per cubic centimeter. Continental crust, made of different material, granite-like material, has a density of 2.7 grams, so the continental crust is less dense and it always floats rides on top of oceanic crust. If two plates come together and one is made of oceanic and the other made of continental, the oceanic crust always subducts because it's more dense. This is really more important for lecture. There's a good video about how the plates are moving around. Is it ridge push, the new material comes up and pushes the plates apart? Or is it the old, already subducted slab that's cold and dense that's pulling the rest of the plate down behind it. Uh, I've included this video, it's a brief introduction to plate tectonics. I highly recommend that you watch it. So is it new material comes up which pushes it apart or, so this would be the new material and as it's moving away it's getting colder just because it's cooling off, right? This was molten, the molten material came up, it solidified and it's cooling and now it's older and colder and older and colder and eventually it sinks and starts to pull as it sinks and now I think most plate tectonics researchers think it's a combination of slab pull and ridge push that accounts for the movement of the plates. So again we'd find shallow earthquakes, very small earthquakes here, larger earthquakes here, and explosive eruptions. So the interactions at plate boundaries, that's where the good stuff happens. Divergent, we have plates pulling apart. Convergent, we have plates colliding. And transform, the plates just slide past one each other, one another. <laughs> it's, I don't know why I've got another picture, but I do. Divergent boundary, they're coming apart. Convergent, they're coming together. Transform, they're just grinding past each other. Again, divergent boundary. Uh, convergent, convert, you can see the trench, convergent, 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 convergent. In fact, there's the Marianas Trench. Uh, South America, extensive trenches there. So we've got divergent and transform boundaries, and then we've got convergent boundaries. Earthquakes, volcanoes happen at the plate boundaries. Moving plates shake, subducting plates melt and get injected upwards creating the Pacific Ring of Fire. So this is a map of the names of the plates, locations of important earthquakes and volcanoes. Oh yeah, they've just got earthquake zones. And then hot spots, which is when a plume of material comes up and melts its way through the crust. For example, forming the Hawaiian Islands. So the little yellow dots are hot spots where a plume of material is coming up through the mantle. This has got to be the Yellowstone hot spot. The little red triangles are volcanoes. Oh yeah, that's also fun. And also the arrows are showing you the direction that the plates are moving relative to each other. So like Africa is grinding into Saudi Arabia, which is grinding into Eurasia. India still moving up into China. So hotspots. Uh, a hotspot is an upwelling of magma not associated with a plate boundary. I keep saying all the good stuff really happens. Most of the good stuff happens by the plate boundaries, but you can also have hotspots that aren't associated with a plate boundary, 
where this material is coming up. For example, the Hawaiian Islands. All right, uh, so I've got this stolen YouTube video. So you've got a plume of material coming up th through the mantle, and then the oceanic crust and the uppermost mantle. Both of those are moving. So the idea with the Hawaiian Islands is the hotspot's been there for 80 million years, and the the islands, as they move off the hotspot, they go extinct. So this could be Kauai. And then we could be making Maui. And then as it gets older and the plate keeps moving, it gets pulled off of that hotspot. So it goes dormant. And then over time, it gradually sinks. Uh, wave action is going to erode it down. Isostasy is going to cause it to depress the crust. And so the largest is the big island of Hawaii. And then as you move away from the big island and the hot spot, uh, the islands get smaller and smaller and smaller. So here's a map or a figure showing the plume coming up from the mantle with Hawaii and Maui, Molokai, Oahu, someplace in there is Kaho Olave, Kauai, Kauai about 5 million years old, Oahu about 3 million years old, Molokai about 1.8, Maui about 1.3, Hawaii, I don't know, 4 or 500,000 to it's being formed right today. And then just offshore, there's a, the newest Lo'ihi, that'll be above the water in about 10,000 years or so. The newest Hawaiian island is being formed as we speak. But there's the Hawaiian island chain and then the Emperor Seamount chain. These are older, older Hawaiian islands that have now completely sunk. So like I said, here's the Hawaiian Ridge, the Emperor Seamount chain, and eventually they're all going to subduct either uh, into this trench or the Aleutian Trench. Another view showing the exact same thing, in case you missed it the first two times. Hawaii, largest, newest, and then they get older and smaller. Oh my gosh, it's a third. Fourth? I'm losing track. We keep going. Oh, another one. Oh, that's nice. All right, that's enough about volcanoes for a while. Let's talk about, or that's enough about hotspot volcanoes. Let's talk about earthquakes. The plates don't grind. They get stuck. And then when they break through, there's a lot of shaking. That's the earthquake. The elastic rebound theory explains how the plates move around. Uh, some keywords you need to know. The epicenter is the location at the surface directly above where the earthquake took place. The subsurface location is called the focus, sometimes also called hypofocus. Uh, epicenter is at the surface. Focus is the actual location where the earthquake started. Here's a map of global seismic hazards and plate boundaries. And like I said, the good stuff seems to be happening at the plate boundaries. In fact, right here, you can't really see it, but the, the Indian plate and the Eurasian plate are colliding. So there is a plate boundary. It's just obscured by the high earthquake risk. Same thing down here in Indonesia, where there's a trench with subduction. So you've got volcanoes and earthquakes, volcanoes and earthquakes, volcanoes and earthquakes, volcanoes and earthquakes. Tectonics. If you like volcanoes and earthquakes, you'll love tectonics. Okay, this is a map showing the distribution of the big earthquakes. I guess it's down to six, magnitude six, from six to nine. And I want you to pay attention to, for example, the size of the earthquakes that are happening on the mid-oceanic ridge. Those are mainly very, very, well, six to seven for the most part. Looks like some seven to eight. This, the big black dots are the largest uh, Fukushima, the Japanese earthquake, the Alaskan earthquake, uh, the Chilean earthquake. Those are the biggest. Those are all megathrust quakes where one plate is very shallowly subducting beneath another. In this case, Pacific under South America, Pacific under North America. And those are the locations of the largest earthquakes. So again, location. If it's a shallow earthquake, it's probably not that powerful. If it's deeper, it's going to be larger. Like a lot of these orange ones are probably caused by subducting plates. And a lot of these orange and red ones are caused by subducting plates. And the black ones are the megathrust earthquakes. 
megathrust, some examples, uh, Japan, 2012, Indonesia, 2010, Chile, 1960, Alaska, 1964, Nepal, 2015, massive, massive, massive earthquakes caused by one plate sliding under another plate, getting stuck, but the motion continues, so the stress builds until it rips loose. So there's one diagram showing the situation that created the Nepal earthquake. Another, another example of the tectonic situation where the Himalayas is actually getting lifted up as India keeps pushing its way into Asia. Cascadia, in our own Pacific Northwest, there are there have been a series of massive, 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 massive earthquakes, maximum size, magnitude nine in the subduction zone. So these are all the megathrust earthquakes. Then we've got deep earthquakes, magnitude seven, and then we have crustal earthquakes like three to seven someplace in there. So again, the location, not only the type of fault, right? In this case, it's a convergent boundary, a very shallow convergent boundary or relatively shallow convergent boundary relatively shallow angle of subduction, um, creating these huge megathrust earthquakes. And then we've got the deep earthquakes, and then we've got crustal earthquakes. Another view showing the whole range. This thing that looks like a colored red warm front, that's actually showing the area at the point of subduction, where the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting Pacific plate is on top here, Juan de Fuca is on top here. Right here, Pacific is on top and the Juan de Fuca is underneath. And then as the plate sinks and melts, eventually when it melts, it bubbles back up, forming the Cascadian Mountains all the way down to Lassen and Shasta and the Medicine Lake Volcano, Mount Baker, Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, all of those are part of the Cascadian chain caused by the subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate. The largest earthquakes are megathrust earthquakes, magnitude nine. Deep earthquakes are smaller, six to seven. And then the smallest earthquakes are occurring within the crust, those shallow earthquakes, like along the spreading centers, magnitude four to magnitude seven, someplace in there. So we've got the megathrust, we've got the deep earthquakes, and then the shallower crustal earthquakes. The megathrust, magnitude nine, and again, this is the symbol for a convergent plate boundary with subduction occurring. Uh, and the triangles are pointing in the direction of the movement of one of those plates. So the Juan de Fuca is moving this way and then sinking. Magnitude nine, megathrust, six to seven, the deep earthquakes, and then magnitude three to seven, the shallow crustal earthquakes. And then the National Seismic Hazard Map reflects that with the largest earthquake damage being done by those megathrust and then the shallower earthquakes with a lower earthquake hazard. So the largest earthquakes are megathrust earthquakes, magnitude line. Deep earthquakes are smaller, magnitude six to seven. And then the smaller earthquakes occurring within the crust, magnitude four to magnitude seven. So volcanoes, very, very similar. The location is gonna determine everything. Location, location, location. Effusive means gushing or flowing eruptions. And explosive, just what it sounds like, they just explode. So the location determines the chemical composition of the magma. The chemical composition of the magma determines how the volcano behaves as it erupts. Does it explode? Does it flow? And the eruptive activity determines the shape. So if you know what shape a volcano is, you know what it's made of, and you know how it's going to explode. If you know how it's going to explode, yeah, it's, it, it's one of those things. If you know one, you know the rest of it. If you tell me where a volcano is, I should be able to tell you if it's going to ooze or flow or just explode. If you showed me a picture of a volcano, I should be able to say, oh yeah, that's gonna explode, or oh no, that's totally safe to watch. Like people right now are in Iceland watching an erupting volcano because it's basalt, it's very fluid, it doesn't explode. People do not go to Mount St. Helens when it's going to erupt because it's going to explode and obliterate everything. So magma, I mentioned this, contains dissolved gases just like a carbonated beverage. As the magma gets closer to the surface, the pressure is released and the gas comes out of solution. 
If the gas can flow through the magma, then you have an effusive eruption. The gas just bubbles away harmlessly, nothing happens. If the gas is blocked, because the magma is made of continental crust, the pressure builds and builds and builds until it just explodes with, often without warning. Subducting continental crust made of granite flows like mashed potatoes. The pressure from the gas builds until there's a massive explosion. Oceanic crust made of basaltic magma flows like maple syrup. Basaltic ma magma flows like maple syrup. So there's no explosion. Uh, the lava just oozes along the ground. Sometimes there's fountains, but it doesn't explode the way continental crust does. You get lava fountains, but no explosions. So at convergent boundaries and subduction zones, where you've got continental material, you're going to have explosive volcanoes. At seafloor spreading centers like Iceland, the mid-oceanic ridge, you're going to have effusive eruptions. And at hot spots like Hawaii, you have effusive eruptions. So the type of, of volcanic activity depends on the source and viscosity of the magma. How thick is it? How fluid? How thin? How fluid it is? When I say thick and thin, I mean, yeah, how fluid it is. Basalt is like motor oil or maple syrup, continental materials like mashed potatoes. Low viscosity magma is very fluid. High viscosity, oh, basalt. Yeah, basalt is low viscosity. High viscosity, very slow moving, very thick. That would be like granite. Types of volcanic activities. The effusive eruptions are gentle. They have very fluid lava. They make shield volcanoes and cinder cones. These very, very flat, 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 flat volcanoes. Because the lava is so thin that it flows very quickly and so it spreads out really thin before it cools. So I think this is just... Yeah, this is from the Big Island. These are examples of lava fountains. I'm just going to leave all of this in, uh, in the lecture slides. The, the videos are embedded. So if you click on the lecture slides, not the video, but the actual lecture slides, it'll have this. I'll also put these into the playlist. That's probably the best thing to do. Never mind. I'll just put all the videos into a playlist. Then you don't have to go poking through. All right. Anything else good? Yeah, fluid, very, very fluid. You can see it oozing over there. Very nice. And this is why people go to see Hawaiian eruptions, because they're predictable. You might have massive lava fountains, like here. The gas is causing the ejection of these massive plumes. That's good. But you can see it. It's flowing about as fast as you can walk. So we've got massive lava fountains. And then eventually it'll just have a big flat surface. Thank you, that was very nice. Explosive eruptions made of highly viscous material. They're explosive. You have very, very steep volcanoes because the lava doesn't really flow far before it cools. So you get these really steep side. All your classic volcanoes, this is, yes. You, you're now about to re, your persistence is about to be rewarded in this class. If you see a picture of a mountain and it looks like a classic mountain volcano, it's a composite volcano. Mount Fuji, Mount St. Helens, Mount Baker, Mount Cook, Mount Rainier, all of those are classic composite volcanoes created out of these explosive eruptions. Less lava, but more pyroclastic flow, pyro, fire, clastic, broken up, broken up fiery stuff. And this is a video of Maurice and Katya Kraft. Uh, here he is saying if he, if he dies in a volcanic explosion, that's okay because that's the way he lives. So this is Mount Unzen, Japan, an explosive eruption. They were in an area that everybody thought was safe. And there was this massive pyroclastic flow traveling 
what what looks like dust is actually volcanic glass, and it's probably three four hundred degrees inside that cloud, and the cloud's probably traveling a couple hundred miles an hour. These people are wisely getting out of the way. This is an explosive eruption. This is why people don't go to see Cascadian eruptions. In this video, uh, Maurice and his wife Katya Kraft and I think forty other researchers were killed, and they had set up their camp, their research camp, in an area that everybody agreed was safe, but. The mountain had other ideas. Oh, yeah, this is a photo micrograph of volcanic ash. After a volcano, you'll see people like shoveling it, wiping off their windshields. Um, and it's actually <laughs> incredibly sharp. Uh, it's not like soft like paper or wood ash. If you When you clean out your fireplace, the ash that's there is very, very soft. This is just shards of microscopically sharp glass volcanic ash. So this is a diagram showing the typical locations of volcanic activity and I wanted to one by one go through how the location is linked to the type of volcanic activity. So we've got two explosive areas right here. We've got a convergent boundary with a subduction zone. Uh, continental crust, this would be the Cascades, this would be the Andes Mountains, this would be Japan, this would be the Aleutian Islands. All of those are examples of convergent boundaries that involve continental crust. Uh, maybe that's better a better example of Japan. Again, there's subduction. Subduction creates explodey volcanoes. If there's rifting, if the crust is, well, if there's a hot spot, right? So here we've got the big island of Hawaii. There's a plume of material. It's a hot spot. I've made the symbol for the effusive eruptions, this very, um, well, you got the explodey volcano, explosive, effusive. The lava is just flowing out, making a very, very flat volcano with a hot spot. Or where the crust is getting stretched apart, this would be northeast, um, northeast corner of California up in the Modoc Plateau. Also Africa, the African rift zone is getting pulled apart, so you got effusive eruptions. Same thing's happening with Iceland. Iceland is over the mid-oceanic ridge. So effusive eruptions, effusive eruptions, and then I put one representing Iceland over the mid-oceanic ridge with the new material coming up. So all the red flat triangles are effusive. The volcano-shaped things are all explosive. So if there's subduction, it's exploding. If the crust is getting pulled apart, divergent, divergent, effusive, and hotspot effusive. So this would be an example. Oh yeah, I gotta back this up. Let's back it all the way up to the beginning. And let's look at some examples of volcanic activity. So if there's rifting, we'll start with there, you're gonna have effusive eruptions, down-dropped fault blocks, grabbins. This would be what's happening in Iceland, what's happening in northeastern California. Uh, you'd have very, very flat volcanoes, little cinder cones, not dangerous. And then, really? Ah, convergence. So this would be oceanic continental convergence. This would be the Cascades. This would be the Andes. Very explosive. That's nice. I like the little explosions. Very stiff material. So lots of explosions from a continental island arc or a continental volcanic arc with a chain of explosive mountains. A, volcan a volcanic island arc, this would be like Japan, also explosive. You've got subduction going on, so you've got these explosive volcanoes, often in a chain parallel to the trench. So here's the trench. As this crust sinks, it's going to melt and bubble back up. And then we've got a hot spot, a plume of material from the mantle, so this could be Kauai, That's it, we get one. 
Oahu. All right, that's good for uh, tectonic settings. I also want to go over volcanic types and how they look. So we've got a cinder cone, which actually I would have put on the side of a shield volcano. These are not to scale. Cinder cones are little tiny compared to shield volcanoes, which are often huge. Composite volcanoes like Mount Fuji, also huge. Dome complexes tend to be pretty small. So let's go back to play this. Who's first? Oh, cinder cone. Yeah, made of basalt, basaltic lava. So it just grows as the gas bubbles up and you get a fountain. So it's just made of loose cinders. They tend to be really temporary because there's nothing solid. It's all just loose ash associated with basaltic eruptions, often on the side of a shield volcano. I really wish that they had done that, but they didn't. What are you going to do? Shield volcano, very fluid, multiple pores of very fluid lava. And then you can also have vents on the side with the cinder cones. That's nice. Yeah, I like that one. Multiple flows, very fluid lava. Shield volcano as opposed to a composite. So you'd have an eruption, an eruption with ash and eruption with lava, an eruption with ash and lava and ash. So you have different layers of material, composite or stratovolcano. They're also sometimes called stratovolcanoes. Your classic exploding volcano. Nobody goes to see these when they erupt because they don't want to die. And then finally, dome complexes like Mount Lassen, very, the thickest, these are the thickest, almost like toothpaste being squeezed up. So these tend to be very, very stiff, very pasty magma. They explode. And we're not going to look at any in this, in this lab though. Dome complexes, thank you. And then some examples, cross-section of a volcano. This would be a classic stratovolcano like Mount Shasta with uh, Shastina, a vent. And here we've got a cinder cone on the side of a shield volcano. Like this is a shield volcano right here, the slope, and then that would be a shield volcano. I'm sorry. Shield volcano, uh, cinder cone. That would be a tiny cinder cone on the big shield volcano. Just like that's a cinder cone, that cinder cone are on the side of a much, much, much larger shield volcano. Composite, ash, and lava, and ash and lava. Tall, steep, all your classic ones. Mount Pompeii, Pompeii Mount Vesuvius, Stromboli, Fuji, Mount St. Helens, Mount Shasta, composed of, you don't need to know that. Explosive eruptions, you need do need to know that. There we've got Fuji, classic volcano shape, made of multiple flows of lava and ash. Hazards, pyroclastic flow. Hot, dry rock fragments and gases, explosive eruptions, over 100 miles an hour. There's a pyroclastic flow. So shield volcanoes, they're very, very wide. They're very flat. They're made of basaltic lava. They don't explode. The lava flows for great distances before it cools because it's so fluid. So here we've got a shield volcano. And these little bumpy things are probably all little cinder cones. All the little bumps you can see in profile, those are all probably cinder cones. Here we've got the birth of a shield volcano bubbling up out of the ocean, this very black, very fluid basaltic lava. And you can see it's incredibly flat, very, very flat. Cinder cones, they're small. There's a bunch in Lassen. They're made of basaltic lava. They do not explode. Frothy basalt is ejected and lands close to the vent. So here is a cinder cone. This, Popocatil, I think. I believe this is Mexico, and it just started in some poor farmer's field. Like a crack opened up, and then hot gases came out, and then it started erupting, and it just didn't stop and like buried everything that poor guy owned. Uh, plug dome, small to medium. Lassen Peak is a good example of a plug dome. Very, very stiff, very, very, very stiff lava. Explosive eruptions. The lava's extruded slowly. So here is Mount Lassen. And you can see some of the solid material that makes up the core. And this was a view, I think, from Redding or Anderson of the eruption back in, I think, 1915 of Mount Lassen. In fact, the eruption 
The eruption, the big eruption of Lassen was visible from the capital in Sacramento. That would have been really exciting back in 1914, 1915. Comparison that shield volcanoes are huge and I keep saying they're flat, they're very flat compared to a composite volcano. Composite, your classic volcano shape. And here we've got the cinder cone and I included the slope of the shield volcano. This is Prospect Peak. This is the cinder cone. Let me back that. This is the cinder cone. It's at Mount Lassen. It is a cinder cone called the cinder cone. I think it erupted in 1640 something. And this is Prospect Peak. So the, the cinder cone is on the side of Prospect Peak. And then here you've got Mount Lassen in the background, Prospect Peak on top of the cinder cone. Uh, Prospect Peak, Lassen. Lassen is very steep compared to Prospect Peak. And another view of Lassen. A shield volcano, incredibly flat. This is a former student, Cody, on the Big Island taking samples of lava, showing, like I, I keep saying, people go to Hawaii to see erupting lava, uh, erupting volcanoes because it is basaltic, because it's very fluid, because it doesn't explode, you can play with it. As opposed to this, gotta be a composite volcano. If that was going to erupt, I wouldn't wanna be within 100 miles of it. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't want to be within a hundred miles of it. Uh, that's it for this part of the video. I'm going to put up another math video, how to do the math for this, uh, for this lab, but that's it for the background on where you find explodey volcanoes, where you find fluid volcanoes, where you find very large earthquakes, where you're, where you find very small earthquakes. I hope you enjoy the lab. I hope you have fun with the Seismic Explorer and I hope you have fun with Google Earth.